On today's show, Quinn Snyder makes the decision to rest key starters in the fourth quarter, and that helps in part lead to the Hawks losing a 15-point lead down the stretch to the Charlotte Hornets. We'll get into that decision and much more, as well as Tuesday's game and double overtime marathon play to get to, and all of that is on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1691 of Locked On Hawks Podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Wednesday evening into Thursday. And today's show is brought to the folks at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase with Game Time. Also, I should encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do, to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out and subscribe to the Locked On Hawks Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. They have places like, of course, Apple, Spotify. We're also on YouTube on the video side. Overcast, Pocket Casts, across the board, we should be there. And if we're not on your favorite podcast platform, please let me know. I'll get that fixed as soon as possible. And today's show is kind of a double episode in some ways. My apologies. If you are a regular listener to the podcast, you will know that I did not have an opportunity to record on Tuesday evening. The short version is I had a travel disaster coming back from Phoenix in the Final Four and could not make it work to both watch the game with the detail that I kind of have to to do a podcast and also record before Wednesday morning. I have since watched that game. Uh, the double overtime marathon loss to the Heat on Tuesday. I'll have some thoughts on that at the very end of this show. Stay tuned for that later on. But to begin the podcast, and for the most part on today's show, a focus on Wednesday's game, which became interesting in a number of different ways. Uh, the end result was a 115-114 to 114 loss for the Hawks in the final home game of the year for Atlanta. That's on their fourth straight loss, and of course a very controversial fourth quarter that we'll come back to in a moment. Um, Setting stage, though, a little bit, a very, very busy injury report that it's kind of an important factor in all kinds of things in this game. So the headliner pregame, and even I would argue postgame in some ways, is that Trey Young came back on Wednesday. He missed 23 games with the um, finger issue, which ended up being, again, a torn ligament in that finger. He was restricted in minutes um, on this evening. He was actually also wearing a rather enormous brace on his left hand, which he talked about postgame a little bit, how he's still working up a strength in that hand. Um, he's only actually had about two days now since he was able to make a fist for the first time on that left hand. Um, as, as someone who watches a lot of basketball, uh, Hawks and otherwise, you very rarely, if ever, see a player, especially a guard, play with the kind of brace that Trey had on. It was very heavy duty. Um, he said he wore that in part because he can kind of be aggressive and not have to worry about it too much while playing with it. Either way, he wore it and he played and uh, obviously looked pretty good when doing it. So that's a positive sign across the board. As I said on the show on Monday evening, the Hawks are, without a question in my mind, better without better with Trey, I should say, on the floor. And uh, they showed that for the most part in this game, despite the loss. And again, bear with me because there's a lot to get to about the game. Um, also, Jalen Johnson, if you missed it on Tuesday, suffered an ankle sprain. Once again, that right ankle bothering him again. He missed the game on Wednesday. He was ruled out ahead of time. No, no further details there. We'll see if he's able to come back on Friday or on Sunday, but obviously the incentive there is to be cautious with Jalen, given that it's a now a repeated right ankle injury, and of course the future is beyond the present for Jalen Johnson. That's, by the way, a theme of the entire podcast tonight in some ways. Also, though, the Hawks were shorthanded because De DeJounte Murray had a quad contusion, did not play in this game. DeAndre Hunter was actually out for rest in this game. Wes Matthews had, a ha had hamstring soreness. He did not play in this game. That left the Hawks down eight players including five of their top eight players for the season did not play in this game. And they had 10 active guys. And by the way, on that active list, three of the 10 have not been in the rotation most of the year, if not at all. Uh, Trent Forrest, Dylan Windler, and Mo Gay were three of the 10 players. And Trent's played a little bit more than the other two, but just kind of goes to show the Hawks were very, very shorthanded in this game. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to it. Now, uh, the Hornets were not full strength either. They're still missing some key guys, Lamella Ball, Mark Williams, etc. The Hawks, though, were still eight-point favorites in this game, in part because Charlotte entered this game with 19 wins. They have the worst point differential in the league, and for three quarters, that was kind of evident. They were pretty bad in this game. But we'll come back to it later on in some respects, but essentially, this was two games in one. If you watch the game, you'll know, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you didn't watch the game, I'll set the stage for you a little bit. So through three quarters of this game, the Hawks were leading by 15 points, and they were playing guys that were available. Again, only 10 guys they had available, but they were playing the guys that they had a relatively normal workload. 
So their top three players in this game that they had available were Trey Young, Bada Badanovich, and Clint Capella. Those are the only three of their top eight guys that actually played in this game. Three of their top six, you would argue, with Bogey kind of being a super sub most of the time. Um, they all played 20 minutes or more in the first three quarters. The Hawks were really flowing offensively. They scored more, sorry, almost about 1.3 points per possession in the first three quarters. That's an excellent figure. They shot 56% from the field in the first three quarters, and they were 14 of 31 from three with 30 assists. Those are all fantastic numbers. Even when you adjust for Charlotte's defense being pretty bad, and it is, the Hawks were shorthanded and really dominating offensively. And again, they were up by 15 points at the end of the third quarter. Now, nothing is assured there. We've seen teams, both pro and con, involving the Hawks, blow leads or come back from leads. Like, it isn't like the game is over at that point in time, but the Hawks were clearly the better team for three quarters. Now, why am I emphasizing that so much? Um, well, the fourth quarter went 38 to 22 in favor of Charlotte. And the biggest story of the night, aside from Trey coming back, because that's more important than anything else, beyond that, was the Hawks essentially pulled the plug in the fourth quarter. Now, if you're a listener on, on the podcast regularly, you will know that I often complain about Quinn Snyder leaving the foot to the floor too often. Um, the Hawks will play their starters with two minutes to go in a 20-point game. Like they, they don't do this ever with Quinn. Quinn is, if anything, more judicious and more aggressive in trying to close games out or whatever. So that was the opposite of that. So Trey, Bogey, and Capella, their top three players that were available, did not play a single second in the fourth quarter. And it wasn't like they were blowing the tape, blowing the Hornets out. Uh, 15 points, yes, but it wasn't 30. Even Garrison Matthews, who I would say is probably their fourth best guy that was available, at least their fourth best guy in terms of like minutes played this year. In fact, it's a big drop from Capella, Young, and, Bo and Bogey, but their next, big, their next biggest guy in minutes for the season is Garrison. He didn't play the last nine minutes of this game. So they were very, very uh, cautious, we'll say. They were not trying to lose, I'll say that, but they also very clearly prioritized the big picture over winning this game. Now, all that said, they had a back-to-back -back last night, double overtime, we'll come back to that in a second, but first I want to play you what Quinn said after the game. First, you'll hear Lauren Williams of the AJC ask a question about Quinn to open the press conference, and after that, you'll hear my follow-up questions, you'll hear my voice, Lauren's voice, etc. Here is the uh, full context of what Quinn Snyder had to say post game about his decision not to play the key guys in the fourth. Coach, how much of that fourth quarter was a mixture of getting guys experience and also, you know, getting some rest for those starters? Well, we didn't have a whole lot of that many bodies, so you know, guys would shift maybe ten minutes off what they regularly play. Um, you know, when we obviously it's an opportunity for you know, the guys on the bench and, uh, you know, they, they got to the foul line in the fourth and Bruno just got fouled. Um, so I felt like we competed and, uh, you know, obviously you always point to things you can do better, but um, you know, it was good to see some of those guys happen. I think they work. You know, a lot of those guys are, whether it's you know, Kobe or Dylan V, you know, that old trend, those guys, you know, they put time in, so for them to have an opportunity to play, I was good. Enough. Did you go into tonight thinking you were going to take it easy with guys like Bogey and Clint after double overtime last night, all the sort of wear and tear of the season? That, that's not really how I would put it. Um, we've had guys during some situations um, that we've really extended from a minute standpoint, and it's one thing to have a back-to-back. -back. It's another thing to have, like, a back-to-back-to-back. And that's almost what that was, you know, against Miami because, you know, the, the double overtime. So I think you're conscious of that right now. Um, but you're always, you know, playing to win, of course, right? I just don't, I, I don't want anybody, because they're really fatigued, um, you know, to have something like that carry over. So obviously that's not a huge deep dive answer from Quinn, where he explains his whole thought process. Not that there, he was ever going to do that. He's not one to give the entire picture a lot. I had a strong feeling heading into post game that he was going to refer to the double overtime game last night. He did that. He talks about how it was almost a back to back to back, as you heard there. That doesn't answer everything, but it's certainly part of it. I would say it's multifaceted here. So for one thing, Trey is in a kind of a diff different category. He was on a restriction, which they said pregame. He was never going to play 30 minutes a game. All that said, like, that was easier to understand. He had just come back from a long, long absence, two months or so. Um, then you have Bogey and Capella, who both played way over their normal minutes last night in a double overtime game. They are the two old heads on this roster who play a lot of miles. 
a lot of mints, I should say, a lot of mods on the tires for those guys. Now, that does not mean that they had to do this in the way that they actually did it tonight. So one of the weird things here is that they actually played for three quarters, built the lead, and then kind of punted in the fourth. That's how they handled it here. Uh, that was a little bit strange. Again, it's less obvious. I was confused by Garrison as well, not playing a lot at the end. That was a bit strange. So as far as what I think about this, personally, I don't have a huge issue with this. Uh, but I also understand why some fans were bothered by it because of the way that it all broke down. So the big thing here is that the Hawks were still technically alive in the race for the nine seed and home court advantage in the 9-10 against the Bulls a week from today. Uh, in fact, as of this recording, they are still technically alive. Um, the magic number now is one for the Bulls, so it's like a 1% chance, I would say. But coming into the night, basketball reference, ESPN, BPI, etc., gave the Hawks like a 5-6% chance of getting to home court in that game. So not impossible, but also not likely at all. Very, very unlikely, in fact. I'm not saying that was the deciding factor, but you could certainly make the argument that a trade-off between the rest of key guys like Capella and Bogey in a quarter in a game here down the stretch compared to the 5% chance of making home court, that might be a reasonable trade-off. I'm not sure, but that's maybe the argument you can make. I also had somebody ask me why Bogey and Capella played at all if they were going to do this in the fourth quarter. Now, number one, I don't know if they were planning on doing this, honestly, but if they were, we, we, we won't know that. But I said it pregame as well. It would have been nice to just rest them in some ways, but they had too many guys out. You have to fill, you have to actually form a team. Like you can't rest everybody at the same time with the Hawks injury situation. Like, yeah, if they had AJ around, if they had Sadiq Bay around, if they had all those guys healthy, you can rest a lot of guys. But right now, like they have, the Hawks had 10 guys tonight with Trey, with Bogey, with Capella. You have to have at least eight in uniform to even play. It would have been hard to rest those guys. So this is me with an educated guess here. I think there was probably a discussion sometime between last night and today in the organization about how they were going to not push too hard in this game minutes-wise for those three guys, Trey, Bogey, and Capella. That doesn't mean they're trying to lose. I've heard uh, I've heard tanking talk. The Haw Hawks had no incentive draft-wise or anything like that to lose this game on purpose. They just didn't maximize their win probability. That's the way I would say. They obviously didn't. If, if all that mattered in the world was winning tonight's game, they would not have treated that game like that. I'm very confident about that. Um... Again, it was very out of character for Quinn. If anything, he usually goes the other way at the cost of maybe putting too many miles on. He doesn't really think about the big picture a lot. He thinks about the game that day and tries to win it. We'll never know all of what that, why they did that, but I, I, I think it doesn't matter a ton basketball-wise. I, th I think the Hawks losing this game basketball-wise, I don't really care. Like, the Hawks are the better team for three, for three quarters. If you're taking this opportunity to kind of make a statement about the Hawks performing the, the fourth quarter was the Hawks' third unit against the starters of the Hornets. They lost, but, like, that doesn't really have a huge impact on anything. Um, I do get, though, why fans are, so, I should say some fans are upset. It's fan appreciation night. That's a little bit, obviously, bad optics there. They didn't put their best foot forward in the fourth quarter. It wasn't even the bench unit. Like, yeah, this is like the third and fourth unit. This was Trent Forrest played the whole fourth quarter. Dylan Windler played the whole fourth quarter. The whole fourth quarter of this game. So, like, they weren't pushing hard. I would say from a more objective standpoint, which is my role on this podcast, I think it was reasonable to prioritize the big picture and the future, even in the near future over the present. I wouldn't operate it the same way, probably. For me, I would probably play guys less during the game and then have them play some in the fourth quarter versus playing them in the first three quarters in the fourth. But Trey staff was probably involved in this decision. We're never going to have the full story. You heard what Quinn said earlier. That's all I got on it. But um, in the end, two things are true. The Hawks were decisively better than the Hornets for three quarters with their actual guys when they were trying. I very confident they, they would have won the game if they had pushed through the tape at the end and they didn't win the game because they didn't maximize the probability in the fourth quarter. So there you go. Um, there'll be arguments about this, I'm sure, for a while, especially if the Hawks were to lose by one game in the in the sort of battle for home court. I do think, just to say one more thing before we get out of here on this segment of the podcast, is that the Hawks don't, I don't think, have much fear going to Chicago. That doesn't mean that it's the wrong decision because Quinn said a lot. Like it's in fact, even tonight pregame, he said there's a reason why they call it home court advantage. Like they wanted that against Chicago, but in the end they did not uh, put the foot to the floor in this spot. All right. We'll have more coming up on the podcast as we always do. But first I'm going to tell you about the folks at game time. 
Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier for you. They have killer last-minute deals, they have all-in prices, views from your seats, and the lowest possible price guarantee. And Game Time is a fantastic option that makes things easy for you across the board. I've been using Game Time for quite some time now, honestly. It's come in handy for me a lot with Braves tickets and Falcons games, etc. And you can save six percent off with buying last-minute tickets for sports and concerts and comedy theater and much more they have flash deals you can save and they also save even more when you choose a section and then let the game time app actually choose the seats for you in that section they have a feature that's awesome where you actually toggle to show up the entire total for your order before you actually get to the end no surprise fees that's very very helpful when you get to check out for your planning purposes you get a panoramic review of the seats in the app before you buy and you are also getting the lowest price of game time or they'll credit you 110 percent of the difference of that price and they're also covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the entire industry, including event cancellation protection and on-time ticket delivery. Take all of the guesswork out of buying tickets with the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app today, create an account, and use promo code Locked on NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem that promo code. It's Locked on NBA for a twenty dollars off on your first purchase. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by Nissan. Are you, are you kind of driver that likes pushing things a little bit further? Do you ever happen to wonder what adventure could be waiting for you around the next corner when you are driving? Our friends at Nissan have a lot of SUVs with capabilities to take your adventure to that next level. And the 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for both city, city drives and great escapes alike. As a classic exclusive Google built-in that you're always updating, a system to call on for almost anything that you happen to need. Gone are the days of connecting your phone because Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD Able Tim system with the touchscreen as well at the Nissan Rogue. And 2024 Rogue is a perfect size crossover for your next big adventure. They also have an incredible lineup across the board that includes a 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. They have up to eight people that can be seated in that Pathfinder as expansive cargo capacity and along with, along with advanced available 4x4 capability in the Pathfinder. 284 horsepower, up to 6,000 pounds of towing. And whenever Metro calls, the Pathfinder is going to be there to answer that call for you. Take out the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure with Nissan. Shop NissanUSA.com. One more time, that's NissanUSA.com. All right, so we'll kind of talk about more about the sort of the ins and outs of this game in some respects. I didn't do my full, like, stat breakdown as I always would because a lot is going on in this game. Um, I focused heavily on Trey and just kind of watching him on and off the ball to start the game and really throughout the game. I wouldn't say he looked super comfortable all the way through. He was like one hand catching passes. Like he's obviously still favoring that that hand. He talked about that pretty candidly after the game. Like I get it. He looked comfortable in some ways. He played very well. It was just if you like the little things. And that makes sense. He's not played basketball for a long time. He's not had, again, the ability to make a fist until this week. Like it's a, it's a quick turnaround for him. But he had a nice steal early on Miles Bridges. He had a nice scoop layup on the early going. He looked good to me. Uh, defensively, I would say it was a challenging context for the Hawks in this game. In some respects, they didn't play very well defensively. Um, for most of the way, I would say they were better in the middle of the game than they were at the beginning. Um, but the Hornets went five out almost exclusively in this game. Um, and that kind of challenged the Hawks because they're the Hawks kind of have to play center right now with the available options that they have. So that was a little bit challenging. And the Hornets actually scored 14 points in a hurry to begin this game, hit three threes. Um, you know, without the Kongwu, without Jalen, the Hawks kind of can't match up with that in some respects. All 10 guys who were available for the Hawks played in this game at least 17 minutes. It was basically everyone playing a bunch. And that kind of made sense in some respects. It was Kobe and Bruno. It was the first time ever that Mo Gay has played in the rotation in his career. He played 17 minutes. We'll come back to him later on. He looked good, though. Uh, Trey's passing. If you're a new listener, you may not know this, but if you're a recurring listener, you will know. I, I think Trey is maybe a top three passer in the world. He's fantastic. And that was on display. All the way through this game, his passing is a breath of fresh air always when he comes back into the game. Um, Mogay had a nice moment in the beginning, sorry, late in the first quarter. He altered a shot as a help, as a help defender, and he had catch a shoot three in transition. That was his first bucket of his career. Uh, I thought he played very well in the first half. He wasn't quite as good after halftime, but certainly gave him a good look, uh, a good lift, I would say, in that first half. They were down six early, but they actually ended up leading for most of the way um, from that point forward until the fourth quarter. A couple of big highlights in the, in the second quarter. Brandon Miller had a huge dunk for Charlotte that kind of made the national rounds. When they got hot, he had two threes that were pretty deep. Briefly, there was a lineup of uh, Buck and Forrest, Matthews, Gay, and Fernando. That's a lineup that was uh, you wouldn't exactly bank on playing a lot, but there you go. The Hawks were up by six at halftime. It was almost almost up by nine because V. Cranchy had a three that was wiped off due to being just after the buzzer. But they were really excellent offensively in that first half. 18 assists in the first half. That's excellent. Including, you know, seven by Trey. They were flying high. And then they had a 12 free run out of halftime to actually go up by 15 points. Trey had a great pass to Capella 
At that point, the Hawks had like a 135 offensive rating. They were really cooking on offense. They had as many 17 points. They had 30 assists after three quarters. Usually a good sign in general, but they had 30, 30 assists on 35 shots that they made. That's a heck of a ratio. They had 35 in the game, but really 30 in the first three quarters, which was really, really impressive. Um, still, though, I will say in the first three quarters, the bench unit wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire. The starters were really good the entire way. The bench was kind of like maybe breaking even, and they were still up down by 15 points. Again, we'll get to the fourth now. I talked about it earlier, but they essentially just did not deploy their best players in the fourth quarter. And immediately, it was a 17-5 to run by Charlotte to go from the Hawks being up by as many as 15 to being up by only three points in about five minutes. They had turnovers, they had missed layups. And at this point, we didn't know yet that Capella, Trey, and Bogey were done for the night. Maybe Quinn did, but we didn't know, obviously, covering the game. So I'm thinking, all right, when the Hawks start come, when, when the Stars come back in the game, they'll probably still win it, but they kind of blew the lead. I thought, and this is a note that I made before I knew post-game what was going to happen, I thought Quinn was kind of showing more restraint in the moment, not bringing those guys back in earlier, because usually, you start blowing a lead, Quinn will go back to starters. And that makes sense. They're trying to win the game. But um, they never went they never went back to those guys. Uh, a couple big threes by Veed, actually. Veed played most of the fourth quarter. That was He's kind of the only core-ish guy that was out there. Um, that was pretty ugly offensively, though. Again, the Hawks had 22 points in the fourth. They didn't shoot it well. Um, they hit four threes in the quarter, actually, including two by Veed. But uh, that was kind of all they did offensively. I will say they were led. Sorry, they were not as many as three in, in the closing minutes. Then Trent Forrest almost pulled the game out of the fire on his own. He actually had three consecutive baskets. And Trey Forrest is a guy I like a lot. Not an offensive force necessarily, but he had three baskets, baskets in a row. Um, a nice moment for him, actually. He's kind of had a weird season in some respects. And by the way, he might end up having to be waived to make room for B. Krejci. If you missed that, I won't do it on this podcast, but I did a whole segment on this. Beat's got to be converted by the end of the season to be eligible in the playoffs. Trent's the logical candidate. That's uh, back in the archive. So go, go find that uh, breakdown at this point in time. But um, the Hawks led by as many as three points. And then they allowed free throws to Brandon Miller. And then Bruno missed a pretty good look from like three and a half, four feet away. That would have that would have put the Hawks up by three points. He misses that. They allow a live ball opportunity in transition. Charlotte goes down and they score with four seconds to go. And then the Hawks fail to get a shot up at the end of the game. So it was back and forth. That trend explosion gave the Hawks a good upper hand. They had a chance to win it at the end of the game still. They obviously were still trying to win, um, but they didn't have their guys on the court. Like, only V of their, you know, better, better guys available tonight was playing. There you have it. So, in the end, it was uh, the fourth quarter. Again, I, I I don't mean to say this flippantly. I would throw out the fourth quarter as far as team evaluation is concerned. Obviously, you can find stuff about players, Bogey and Veet and all that stuff. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but as far as, like, Hawks being good, Hawks being bad. They played their third unit in the fourth quarter. There you go. Uh, as far as the players are concerned in this game, a quick breakdown of everybody who everybody who saw the floor in this one. All 10 guys. Mo Gay had his by far his biggest role in an NBA game. Uh, three points, seven rebounds, three assists, a steal and a block. Lots of high highs for Mo Gay. He had a three in this one. Uh, some low lows as well. He's still very raw, but still you kind of see the, the signs. That's been the whole thing about Mo Gay this year is that even in the preseason, people were like, he's going to start. He's going to play a lot. He was never going to do that. And then, of course, he had the injuries to make it even worse. But you just hope that he's healthy going into the offseason. And the flashes and the tools are obviously there for Mo Gay. So that was all on display in this game. Good moments. Four fouls. Like He was flying around in a good way, energy-wise. Played just fine. He was the only bench guy that actually was not super underwater in the plus-minus in this game. Dylan Windler hit four threes. Played 26 minutes. Uh, hit 12 points and was a game-worst minus 20. Kind of indicative in some ways. He made shots, but the bench was pretty rough in this one across the board. Forrest had those three shots that he made in a row, had five assists. But, uh, you know, he was just okay for the most part. Didn't do a ton um, on offense in this game. Bruno, I thought, was brutal, honestly. Like, for a guy who's going to have to play, if a Congo was not available, and I think he's probably not going to be at this point, if I had to guess, Bruno's going to have to play in the playoffs. He's had some rough moments recently. He was pretty bad in this game, I thought. Five points, six rebounds, to have five fouls in 25 minutes. Missed a couple of monies, I just kind of lost along the way in this one. And then Bufkin had some nice highs. He had 11 points, um, did have five fouls. Defensively, he was pretty active, but he was only three of nine on twos. A couple nice finishes around the rim, I will say, but uh, up and down for him, for sure. Uh, to the starters, V. Krejci played the most, played 33 minutes. That was actually a game high in this one. 19 points, two steals, two assists, four rebounds. Um, minus five because he was on the four in the fourth quarter, but uh, he was five of six on twos, three of eight from three. 
beat was pretty good, I thought, overall in this game. But, uh, you know, there you go. Garrison Matthews played 31 minutes, 10 points, 4 assists. He actually might have gotten to, like, 38 minutes if he kept playing in the fourth quarter. But uh, I thought he played fine when he was out there. Um, Bogey looked better in the second half than the first half. I thought he missed a lot of shots short in the first half. Got hot later in the game. 19 points, 8 assists for Bogey, and he was actually at five threes. Looked decent in the third quarter. Um, was probably a little bit tired before that. Uh, Capella, I thought, was really good in this game, actually. 15 points, 6 rebounds in 21 minutes. 7 times from the field, so 70% there. Plus 14. Uh, just looked like himself. Looked pretty good in this game. And then Trey. So, Trey had 14 points and 11 assists in 21 minutes. So, 11 assists, 21 minutes. He went 5-5 five, from five the floor, including two threes and two free throws. So, he didn't miss a shot in the game. Again, he's not like his full self right now with like one and a half hands, basically. But he looked good enough, and it was very apparent right away. The offense just flows with Trey. Um, obviously, we've not seen Trey and Ajante or Trey and Hunter or Trey and Jalen. Those guys weren't available in this game. But Trey's an awesome offensive player. That's not a huge surprise. But if you need a reminder of that, that was very much on, on display here. The Hawks moved the ball very well in this game. I thought he played. I thought he looked good. He, he played well um, and like checked all the boxes. Obviously, we'll see how he looks on Friday. And on Sunday, in advance of the game on Wednesday in Chicago, or probably in Chicago, it might be in Atlanta still. But yeah, I thought Trey looked the way that you hoped he would look coming back from the injury. The brace, we'll see how long that lasts, but uh, he needs it right now. 11 assists, 14 points, like he, he looked good to me. So there you go. Uh, last thing, by the way, Bogey now has the most threes in a season in Hawks franchise history. He actually passed Trey on that list tonight. Also has an, an 88 game streak of a three in every game. That is the eighth longest streak in NBA history. So Bogey continues to uh, pour it in as a shooter, hit five threes in this game, and a little bit of history there at the end of this game breakdown. All right, we'll have more coming up as far as the Heat game, actually. A brief look back at what transpired on Tuesday. But first, a word from our folks at BetterHelp. Sometimes we just need to get something off of our chest in our lives, whether it's big or small. Certain stuff can actually really get to you if you let it. It's important to let that stuff out, especially as someone who's unbiased on your life. And today I want to tell you about something, and actually for maybe a few of you that might be listening to this stuff in a similar space, you might understand. And I really have some unease about the next steps in the media industry, covering sports in the way that I do and you know, online, basically. And I'm not talking about what's reported by the Hawks or around the Hawks. But more so, rather than just actually getting like jobs for me, podcasting has been upheaval in my life on that front. And uh, it's been a challenge in the modern landscape. And of course, not the most intense thing in the world. I'm not popping topic necessarily for you, but there can be different for everybody, including me. Most of us have bigger problems, and this includes me for sure, and stuff involving sports and media. But it's also quite important to get stuff off your chest every once in a while. If you think about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's not to be flexible. It's suited to your schedule. And the place to go is betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. Get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. And that's one more time here. That's better. Better, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. All right, and quickly back to the game on Tuesday. Again, I apologize. I was uh, It was basically impossible for me to record, but I hate missing games. And uh, I got to say, it was kind of deeply hideous basketball at times on Tuesday, especially at the end of the game. Uh, close games are not always good games in some respects. It was not well played at the end, but there was a lot of drama. So there's something to be said for that. By the way, that goes both ways. I thought the Heat were horrendous on offense at times on the stretch of this game. Butler, who was a great player, was awful at the end of the game. I should note that there's credit to be given to the defenses, including the Hawks. They played pretty well defensively at times in the game, but some nuts and bolts first. They were down 12 at halftime, were, were the Hawks, after being down by 15 points, or I would say at least that many, in the first half. They didn't make a single free throw in the first half, which is kind of hard to do. They shot a point from three. They let Tyler Hero get off a little bit before halftime. That was kind of hurtful to the overall project for Atlanta. They did a great job getting back into it, though, in the third quarter. That's been a theme of this team at times. They've been resilient and do not really roll over, which is always a positive thing. They didn't shoot it great in the third, but Hunter had 13 points in the third quarter alone. Um, Hawks actually also started winning the possession battle pretty soundly in the third quarter of the game on Tuesday. And Miami turned the ball over seven times in the third. That kind of swung things for the Hawks to come back and get back into the game. Then it got really ugly in the fourth quarter in overtimes, like very obviously so. Both teams scored 21 points in the fourth quarter. That's rough on its own. The Hawks, outside of DeJounte, shot very poorly. DeJounte had 11 points, though. He was actually quite good in the fourth quarter. Made a jump shot to, to tie the game at the very end. Keep the Hawks alive in the contest. But here's the game in a nutshell in some ways. 
the Hawks ended up in the fourth quarter and overtime and the two overtimes combined. So that's 22 minutes of gameplay. They were 11 of 38 from the field and one of 14 from three. There you go. That's kind of the game in some respects. They scored 31, 31 points in 22 minutes. That's almost two full quarters. 31 points is not going to be enough to win. They didn't score a single point for the first three and a half minutes of second overtime. At that point, they were only down six, actually. They only scored four points in the, whole, in the whole period. So that kind of made it academic. Offensively, the process at the end of the game was really rough. A lot of con- contested jump shots. Um, it seemed to be tired, which I understand. And that's kind of maybe again played into today, bringing, bringing things full circle. They were gassed. I also don't understand this, and this is something I should say to Quinn even as well. Most coaches, not just Quinn, most coaches do, just don't sub in overtime periods. And that a lot that kind of led to guys like Bogey and Capella playing 10 straight, 15, 16, 17 straight minutes at the end of the game, which just shouldn't be happening in game 78 of the season or 77 of the season. So guys were gassed. Um, suddenly it's fine that it's overtime, but like I get it, but they overextended probably a little bit last night. So zooming back out a little bit from the nuts and bolts portion of that breakdown, the Hawks just didn't make shots in the game against Miami. They shot okay from two, but they were 10 of 46 from three. 22%. Hard to win. We're going to do that. Um, Jalen was one of one. Garrison was three of nine. But everybody else, so the, the, the three most prolific shooters that the Hawks had in the game on Tuesday, Murray, Bogdanovich, and Hunter, combined to shoot six of 31 from three. You're going to lose more often than that. The Hawks were actually able to be in the game and go to overtime and overtime again because they dominated the possession battle. Now, if you're a listener that is a recurring listener, you'll know that I talk about this a lot. This is an extreme example. The Hawks ended up taking 25 more shots than the Heat did from the field in the game. Now, they lost the free throw battle a little bit, but still, it is hard, honestly, to lose when you take that many more shots than your opponent. But that means you shot a lot worse than your opponent, and they did in this game. But the Hawks did what they what they kind of could do on the margins to get in the game. Again, they're playing without... Playing without Trey, they lost Jalen in the middle of the game. Like Akong was still out. They won on the margin. They just didn't make shots. So I won't do a full player, a full player breakdown so we can get out of here at the end of the podcast. But the starters struggled on the whole on Tuesday compared to the starters being really good on Wednesday. Different players, but the lineup construction basically was a similar. Uh, I thought Capella, who was really actually pretty good on Wednesday, was pretty bad on Tuesday. Um, his, his worst game in a while. Bogey was really brutal on Tuesday as well. 417 from the floor, a game worst minus 22 against the Heat. Jalen got hurt. I mentioned that earlier, but he at least made some shots. He didn't play great either. Uh, Hunter and Murray were the guys who actually did get shots to go down, but neither one of those guys were efficient. They both had more shots than points in the game. Not a great ratio there, despite some high scoring totals. At some point, they kind of had to have DeJounte do that because he was the only guy kind of doing that, but he kind of was brutal at the end end of the game. He was really good in the fourth quarter to create overtime, but he was kind of bad in the fourth, uh, sorry, bad in the overtime periods. Um, But hey, they didn't even get there without his 11 points in the fourth quarter, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, ironically, Bruno and Garrison were the guys who, who kind of performed better than their normal baselines on Tuesday. Bruno was really bad on Wednesday, but it was kind of a you know ping pong situation there. So, you know, look, it was a close loss to a Heat team that is, like, beatable, but a solid enough team. It was excruciating to watch, I got to say, down the stretch. But um, it feels like it was a lot, a lot of time to go now because so much happened today between Trey's return and the wild decision in the fourth quarter, all that stuff. But I want to at least touch on that a little bit at the end of the show. Hopefully you will uh, get more of that if we need to in the future. Before I sign off, the Hawks now have two games left. Tonight was the last home regular season game of the year. Now there's still a chance Hawks have another home game. They probably have to get to the actual playoffs, although there's still a technical 1% chance that they actually host the playing game. Probably not. So, if there's another home game, it's going to probably be in like another week and a half, two weeks. It's going to be a long time. But um, anyway, two more games on the schedule. They play Friday in Minnesota, and they play Sunday afternoon in Indiana. And then the 9-10 playing game is a week from today. It's going to be Wednesday night, probably in Chicago, definitely against the Bulls. So the Hawks have two games in between them. The Bulls play on Thursday in Detroit. If the Bulls win, that clinches the 9-10. Nothing else matters. And the Hawks have quite literally nothing to play for on Friday or on Sunday. If the Bulls lose to the Pistons, which could happen, I guess, um, then Friday becomes a game they might have to try a little bit more in. If that game is meaningless on Friday or Sunday, you'll see more guys rest. We'll see. Um, the Hawks do have injuries to kind of navigate, but um, I think Trey might want to play because he's, he's not been playing, but 
they will at minimum take it easy if the, if the games don't matter on guys like Bogey, guys like Hunter, guys like Capella. Jalen will see Okongwu is still out with no update at this point in time, although he's due for one probably in the next day or two. But um, keep it locked. We'll have a full breakdown of the games before and after. But um, yeah, it, there's a chance that neither one of the games on Friday and Sunday mean anything in the standings, like actually anything. And then they're, then they're just tune-ups to get ready and hopefully rested and healthy for, again, a win-or-go-home game no matter what. Wednesday, April 17th, is a winner go home for the Hawks, no matter what. That's already set against the Bulls. All we know, all we don't know at this point in time is where that game's going to be, although it's probably going to be in Chicago. And if they lose that one, they're done. If they win that one, they will go on the road again to either Miami or Philly or Indiana. TBD on that, but we'll have more on that in the future. Okay, I'm done talking. It's been 30 plus minutes at this point. Please subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcast, places like Apple and Spotify. As well as YouTube on the video side, please rate and review and like and share the podcast. Please spread the word for me. It'd be huge, huge, huge if you found Hawks fan friends in your life and put this podcast in front of them in some form or fashion. I would consider it a personal favor to me. So thank you, thanks in advance for doing that. Um, also, check out the podcast on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. I'm also on there at BT Rolling. I also write about the Hawks sometimes on my Patreon at patreon.com slash BT Rolling. Doing some brave stuff on there, some Hawks stuff on there, sharing extra audio etc. Some extra bonus content if you want to support me in my endeavors covering the Atlanta sports scene. And uh, with all that said, please subscribe to the show and we'll see you all later on this week.